Good morning, boys and girls. <clears throat> Continuing the intro introductory book series, here's a very nice one. The Teachings of Juan Po, translated by John Blofield. It's a very nice, like 130 pages, very nice intro to Zen uh, <clears throat> by one of its, uh, you know, written, transcribed from one of the, the truly great masters, Wang Po. Uh, David, David Hawkins went gaga over this guy. And, and for those of you who followed Dr. David Hawkins, the, the, uh, the psychiatrist, mystic, whatever he was, kinesthesiologist, he ranked him way up there, up there with the very, very highest of illuminates. <clears throat> so you won't waste any, any effort by reading this book. A couple of uh, things. This book was translated in 1959, I think. So it makes it one of the earliest uh, translations. No, 1958. One of the earliest authoritative translations of Zen that we have. And so it was a very influential book back then. I myself didn't discover it until fairly recently. Uh, <clears throat> reading some other books of Zen. Now, uh, a, a caveat, John Blofield is not an illuminate himself, or at least he was not at the time of this translation, which was some time ago. But he's a very, very uh, uh, solid guy. Uh, technically, spiritually, in terms of his honesty and clarity. and uh, he, But he had some great consultants. He had some, I think, some... Uh, Chinese or Japanese Chan or Zen consultants when he was going through this book. Now this book also happens to be on Audible and so that's always nice. <clears throat> and so uh, one last thing, it's not just for beginners, it's also for intermediate uh, folks. It's good stuff and it's enjoyable by any level. So so uh, the Teachings of Juan Po, John Blofield Translator, Grove Press. All right. Uh, by the way, I do recommend this now for, for any students, any current students. Okay, let's go. What have you learned? <clears throat> I've been reading the, one of the David Hawkins books. Oh, good, good. What a timely thing. All right. Um, yeah, it's funny. I just went over a, a page where he talk, he talks about that book. About Wang Po? What does he say? Uh, I forget. This is all Hawkins really was. had available to him, right? I mean, in, mm -hmm. in uh, Chan or Zen. And so uh, it made a very uh, uh, lasting and deep impression on him. Which book are you reading? Yeah. Um, I what's it called? I one second. David R. Hawkins is a uh, a, a mystic, an accomplished one, who uh, wrote four or five books and had some fantastic lectures that he gave. Very, very inspiring lectures for a certain type of person. I highly recommend you recommend them to you. However, unfortunately, they have been put behind a paywall. If, if uh, you're so inclined, I recommend paying the fee and listening to these lectures at least. Uh, there's not so many of those, maybe 20. How many lectures of Hawkins do you think there are total? Complete How many lectures? lectures? Yeah, complete lectures. Around 20? I don't know. They took them down, didn't they? Yeah, they put them behind a firewall. But... <clears throat> And you can't judge him from the little snippets that are on YouTube. So, I, But all of his books are on uh, Audible. I think pretty much all of them. And also, uh, you can pay the fee. I don't, it's not very much, 10 bucks, 15 bucks. And then you have free access to them for a month or something like that. And you can, you can listen to quite a few in a month. And I recommend it, especially for those of uh, Westerners who have a Christian background. He's a, a very interesting guy and uh, has some very interesting content. 
David R. Hawkins, I believe. Did you find it? Yeah, it's called Discovery of the Presence of God, okay. Devotional Non-Duality. Okay, so he did and devotional stuff and non-devotional stuff, but this is the devotional. Good. It's the sixth book. Yeah, as he got older, he got more and more devotional as he started facing the uh, the wide blue yonder. Mm. Um, but what he says about Huang Po, uh, he says, well, he, it's in the beginning of this chapter, the mind's content is expressed in linear forms such as concepts, ideas, images, and concordant emotionality. Mm -hmm. By spiritual endeavor, these are surrendered and thereby de-energized. By spiritual, you, you blocked out a little bit. By spiritual what? By spiritual endeavor. Endeavor, good. These are, these are surrendered and thereby de-energized. Okay. At good. some point, an apprehension may arise that the self is being obliterated, and therefore I will no longer be me. Even further, the fear may be that one will cease to exist, which arises as the classic fear of non-existence or not nothingness. Very good. Yeah. Un understandably, the thought is that if the I consists of just programs and they are surrendered, will not the I disappear also? Thus, it is important to understand the meaning of void, especially so in view of the pervasiveness of the lack of full understanding of the term from various Buddhist texts and other writings such as the pathway of negation described in the Zen teachings of Huang Po, calibration 850. 850. Subsequent, subsequent to the quoted teachings, Huang Po continued to evolve to consciousness level 960. 960, as was woo! And transcending the levels of consciousness. Yeah, 960, that's way, way, way up there. I think that's just below Jesus or something. Now, mm -hmm. a, an important point that actually he brings up very nicely in that paragraph. In this book, they refer to emptiness as the void. That was a mm. very, I think, a, a very unfortunate mistranslation. Uh, we can date it back to, uh, oh, what's his name? The German who translated a lot of this stuff. Uh, I'm blocking on his name for some reason. Uh, Wilhelm. And that set Jung back, and it set all American, all English speakers back quite a bit because he was, you know, considered a pretty authoritative translator. But he translated <clears throat> the emptiness as void. And nothing could be further from the truth, frankly. And so uh, it's good. See, and you can get a taste from what he just read that, uh, of... Uh, the clarity of, of Hawkins writing and thought and understanding of what his students were, you know, going through. Because some people are afraid when they think about emptiness mm -hmm. and especially the void, it sounds very scary because what are you going to do, right? Right. <clears throat> so uh, the answer to that question is within that book and within these teachings here right now. Excellent. Thank you. So okay. one of his concepts is, is the linear versus non-linear yes, sir. Uh, mind. And um, I guess I had sort of an insight where like the awareness is non-linear, but we have this idea, we have this idea that it is and that like I, you know, I, I was born and I grew up and, but then when I stop and think about it, and I think, like, when did my awareness start? There was no moment. Like, it didn't... I don't think it emerged. It just... It, like, right now, it, it it's just was. There. Right. And it's not, it's not something that came from anywhere, per se. Like, it didn't... Yeah, so you were aware in the womb. Demonstrably so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you have something of a memory also in the womb. So that's interesting point, too. Uh, this thing about linearity versus it's linearity versus what? Non-linearity. Uh, and by what? Yeah, what does he mean by non-linearity? Anything particular, mathematically? 
No, it's not a mathematics. It doesn't okay. mean a mathematics. So this, uh, an image just occurred to me that that, that of a landslide <clears throat> or even a uh, an avalanche. So in the beginning, a clod or two at the top of the mountain, let's say, a rock starts to roll down the, the slope. <clears throat> and then that rock hits another rock. And you could say that that's kind of linear. But then... Uh, as more and more rocks start coming loose, they start to act synergistically in a non-linear manner. And that's what this Dharma work is like. At first, it's difficult, it's hard, it's linear, and, and, and any advances are, are painstaking. As you go on with the work, it gets easier and easier, like that avalanche or that, avalanche or that landslide. And pretty soon, the, you you realize that you're not in charge of it anymore. It's it's happening by itself. Mm. You're, you're past the stage of regression and now you're in the stage of, of rapid acceleration. Do you have his chart there at the back? Is that at the back of the book? There's a few, yeah, which ones? Uh, the scale of, of I, I wanted, that's what I'm trying to get to is the title of his chart where he, he ranks people in terms of their, essentially their closest. The map? Yeah, the map of the scale of consciousness. The map of the scale of consciousness. If you haven't seen this, folks, you should probably definitely, I mean, you should definitely take a look at it. It's a lot of fun, and a lot of people are very, very attracted to it. <clears throat> and as a, an introductory schemata, it's uh, very good for that, for energizing and, and things like that. Uh, eventually, you'll discard it, but... Does he say any? Does he say anything in the legend about that chart? Um, I mean, he's got a whole appendix on it. You want to read a paragraph just for folks? There may be some David uh, R. Hawkins fans out there, which would be good. He's got an appendix on how to calibrate the levels of consciousness. He says. The energy field of consciousness is infinite in dimension. Specific levels correlate with human consciousness, and these have been calibrated from one to a thousand. These energy fields reflect and dominate human consciousness. Everything in the universe radiates a specific frequency or minute energy field that remains in the field of consciousness permanently. Thus, every person or being, whoever lived, and anything about them, including any event, thought, deed, feeling, or attitude, is recorded forever and can be retrieved at any time in the present or the future. Very good. So, so <clears throat> he apparent. What's the copyright on that book? This one is twenty eighteen. Oh, so that's post posthumous. Yeah. All right. So. I guess some but books. it was pre-published, I think. Just... Uh, let me look it up. Any, okay, while you're gone, I'll, I'll talk to the audience a bit. So uh, he, he was a, a physician and also uh, very much uh, inclined towards scientific uh, and rational and logical explanations and delineations of things. And so he kept up with quantum physics. And what he's describing are these big universal fields. And he's maintaining that there's these frequencies that are associated with higher consciousness, which is another way to describe it, probably just as good as anything else, almost. And uh, he, he, he noted that, that science and spirituality were, were uh, kind of like coming together like this because of the, uh, basically because of the advances in quantum mechanics. But go ahead. Uh, it says originally published 2006. Okay, that sounds more like it. 2006. So he's a fairly recent guy, unless you're 20. <laughs> okay. All right. So questions about Hawkins or any of his stuff? I really recommend all of his books. And there's probably six of them or something like that. And they are on uh, uh, some of them are on Audible, which is a nice thing. And does he yeah, read? Does he, he read, does he read? If if he's reading it, that's even better. He's got there's a few that he reads, and there's a few that are on Audible that are his lectures, I, th I believe. And if you could get his lectures on video, which you can behind the paywall, it's highly recommended. 
Mm. A very accomplished Christian mystic. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, oh, first, a clarification on his linear versus nonlinear. He also he uses content versus context as well. That's very that's very Sufic of him, of course. The contents of consciousness occur, as it were, at one level of speaking, within consciousness. That's you know you'll get past that eventually, but that's a a good approximation. And to differentiate the container from the content is something people really have a hard time doing. And, and very few things are as important intellectually and spiritually. Uh, people see a man in long black robes and he's got the collar and he's got the white thing or they see someone in long Tibetan robes or something like that and they assume that he must be spiritual or holy. And that's right. just, that's not no way to judge anything spiritual. You can't go by appearances. And, you, and <clears throat> more than that, when you get to the content, say for example, in a book or a lecture or a talk, it's very important to distinguish uh, the wheat from the shaft, the uh, the chaff. How do you pronounce that? Chaff? Chaff. I don't know. Uh, I pronounce it like <clears throat> the South Texas Mexican. The wheat from the shaft. At any rate, so, so the, uh, that's a very, very important point, something the Sufis drill home over and over and over. You got to separate the interior content from the external context. And that becomes also important uh, intellectually when you look at someone like, uh, what's his name? Langdon, Chris Langdon, you know, a very interesting guy also. Hmm. For those of you who have not heard of him, he, he's an unusual guy. He's got the highest recorded, apparently the highest recorded IQ in the United States, if not the world somewhere around 190 and he's developed his own uh, metaphysics which are quite sophisticated and include uh, as subsets contemporary science and, and philosophy and, and religions and all that and it's all quite coherent but he's also a big guy on separating content from or content everything must have a context or it doesn't exist something like that who is this Chris Langan? La I ha have not mentioned him before. I don't. I haven't really <clears throat> reviewed him enough to recommend him. But it's Chris Langdon, L-A-N-G-D-O-N, or something like that. Really smart guy, hard in the right place, a little rough around the edges, but the, so what? But he's an example. If you went by the, he was a bouncer. The guy looks like a bouncer too. He's a big, burly guy, big muscles, and all this other stuff. And he doesn't look like he's very smart, much less spiritually as advanced as he appears to be. But you'd miss this guy altogether if you were looking for degrees or looking for someone who looked holy or someone who had a holy life or something like that. None of that is relevant. Mm. So... Something fun, to look, um, something, something fun to look at for the geeks. Uh, he appeals more to geeks. Mm. And he, it's, it's quite credible that he has an IQ of 190 or something like that. It's, it's quite believable. Smart guy. <sighs> I mean, of course, that doesn't mean anything in, spiritual, in the spiritual realm. But it makes it more entertaining. I can't vouch for him yet. Go ahead. Um, in the in this book, talks about talks about Kundalini and brain chemistry a little bit. Curious what you have to say about this. Kundalini is, I, I believe, a, a. I don't know if they describe it in the Vedas. Yeah, go ahead, read it. Um. Well, he says, I'm just taking a part, in deprogramming the experiencer from the evolutionary development of the ego with its multifunction complexity, 
It can be seen why spiritual evolution takes time plus effort, awareness, and high motivation. To undo this complex mind, ego, experiencer, self apparatus, apparatus sequentially is not possible without the motivation or assistance of a specific spiritual energy that has the necessary power. Traditionally, the spiritual energy was labeled kundalini to indicate its serpentine course as it rises up the energy channels of the spine through the ascending energy centers, traditionally termed chakras. This unique transformative, transformative energy, which appears at consciousness level 200, changes the physiology, physiology and dynamics of the brain, including hemispheric dominance. Consequently, there is a shift in brain hormones and neurotransmitters. And then he has a chart. Okay, uh, I don't doubt that what he says about brain chemistry is true. I mean, it's demonstrably true. Uh, you could evoke the Kundalini in yourself and it'll, it'll snap your back and you can feel your brain change, right? I mean, it, 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 it's very refreshing, frankly. Uh, and the Sufis classically describe it as something else. And so this is something that's very much in, our, in our history. I forget the word they use in Arabic. It's just going to be the word for energy, right? Hmm. Now, <clears throat> in and of itself, as I was taught, it's of not particularly importance. I mean, I used to have that all the time, especially after I woke up. Uh, my just, I would just snap. Uh, my spine would just snap into into. I'd be meditating and all of a sudden <laughs> and uh, it felt good afterwards it felt refreshed like I'd taken a, a, a nice nap mm. but my teachers just ignored it I mean they they eventually they commented they say you know some people would die to have that and I said oh really I mean I had any, any idea what kundalini was or any of that stuff and <clears throat> they said yeah but you know and but they didn't even it wasn't a, an issue so I don't know if I can, I know I can't speak authoritatively about the history of the use of, of, uh, of uh, I can't speak authoritatively of the history of Kundalini Yoga, but I wouldn't be surprised like other things in the body and the brain, they're of second, relatively secondary importance. No, they're definitely of secondary importance. Their importance in body physiology, I do not know. Does he give any references for changes in brain chemistry? No. Okay, and lateralization is, is tricky to, to measure, but it can be measured. Uh, Hawkins, he, much? Go ahead. He, he has a chart, and he, he, he says that when the lower mind, like your sense perceptions, go through the thalamus and then to the quickly to the amygdala and slowly to the cortex. All right. Uh, but in the higher mind, there's an etheric brain that processes the inputs fast, as fast as the thalamus. Okay, so now he's invoking an etheric brain. You know, mm -hmm. Hawkins was a bright guy, but he was also a guy, he was a product of the new age. And mm -hmm. uh, he did, he, he's not no slouch. And so there's, uh, I'm sure there's something to that in my world, it wasn't central. <clears throat> now, mm -hmm. ultimately, though, in my world, these processes are not tied to the brain, particularly. Now, he may be describing something very real. I don't know, frankly. Mm -hmm. But I but haven't seen those studies, and it'd be, I mean, we, it could be done, but it'd be difficult to do. I mean, how do you measure inside a thalamus? Yeah, I don't know. Um, oh, one of the things it seems to imply is that that energy, like that kundalini energy, is the same energy that gives you power to overcome your ego or the, the small Well, self. see, this is where we get into some, some problems because uh, if you use kundalini as a metaphor, which has mm -hmm. been done, and you and and you you think it's the beginning and the end of everything, uh, then people become motivated by that and it is kind of a way station I suppose I don't know I've seen people hopping around with their kundalini they'll be there meditating and they'll just like hop up and and but it becomes 
that's kind of a city. I mean, it's, it's off to the side. It's a, it's a something that, you know, is interesting of, of sorts, and it may be interesting to one person or another. If it motivates them to keep going, then good. But if that's their goal, then bad. Do you see, follow me here? So, so uh, this is not a, 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 I mean, a side effect of this work can be good health and robust health. Like if you're doing yoga and you're doing prostrations and you're doing, you know, you're take, really taking the uh, paramita of energy very seriously, it can be very good for your health, but that's not its goal at all. And so uh, this is where uh, Hawkins and I part ways a bit. Uh, he also did some things with kinesthesiology, which, uh, uh, although I've tried them myself, and I can see where he might have gotten something, and I, I can also envision a mechanism by which it could possibly work for him, right? I mean, so what? the kinesthesiology, yeah. you know, truth versus falsehood. And yeah. but, but I think that is too esoteric for most people. It's not reliable for most people, and it's subject to abuse by many people. And so I don't recommend that. That's between uh, reality and, and, and David Hawkins, is what I would say. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you're talking to new age people, you should talk in the language they understand. And that's what he did. And I mm -hmm. use new age in it very loosely because many of his students were were too young for the new age, right? But that was the language they spoke. He was from Sedona, for God's sake. You know, the highest concentration of, of tie-dye hippie mystics in, in the world, probably. But is that because he was there? Or is it... He went well, there they're interdependent. I mean, it, it's, it's like that because he was there, in part. But he may have been like that because of where he was. It was interdependent origination. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's very interesting that people can think for themselves and decide for themselves. That'd be the best thing. I, I went, I went, I stopped there when I was traveling. Oh, you went to Sedona? It's ago. beautiful, huh? Yeah. It's got a, a certain yeah. energy to it. I mean, it's hard to know whether that's, you know, something that is an expectation that's being created or met yeah. by that. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, there's no doubt it's beautiful and beautiful, unique landscapes and uh, amazing views. It'll, bring, they, you, they it'll add, bring you closer to God, that beauty. You they know, power that landscape. And crystals and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, it's a crystal cap capital of the, of the Southwest. Yeah, that's, yeah. So different strokes for different folks. That's my impression. I do recommend that people read his books. Especially uh, Westerners, especially Americans and Europeans, mm. and maybe Australians and New Zealanders. They get left out a lot from New Zealand folks. Okay. Anything else on that? Hmm. Last thing on that, how does how does karma relate to like not you know the self being nonlinear? Def define karma for me. Well, I guess the idea of karma is that there's past actions that lead to results in yeah. in the future. If you lift weights you're going to have bigger muscles. It's cause and effect in this world. Mm -hmm. Right? That's all it means. Right. Cause and effect. I don't even think, in Clary's, in this monumental translation of the flower ornament, which I'll probably plug again today, uh, I don't think he uses the word karma. Does he? He know. avoids it because it's one of those words that means all kinds of different things to different people. So, so your question is, what does cause and effect have to do with nonlinearity? Like, how do you, yeah, how do you put the two together? The way it would re relate in David Hawkins' scheme is that the after a certain point, 
it's like okay the universe is conspiring to bring you home truth wants you there right but but it's difficult to overcome our egoic uh selves the the greedy the selfish the self-preoccupied the the uh vain all the things that we associate with our human selves <clears throat> once you get past a certain it's like a refrigerator magnet how about that that's a good good one so here's the refrigerator right here's a magnet as you bring mm -hmm. it closer it starts getting pulled faster pull and i think mm -hmm. that that's what is that that's uh it's a what inverse of the squares what's that relation it's attracted at a, at a rate that becomes stronger and stronger as it approaches the refrigerator the refrigerator magnet and so mm -hmm. it's harder to hold the magnet you know a quarter inch from the refrigerator than it is to hold it out here because the it's an inverse square law, I think it is. Something like that. And so what Hawkins did, and I think this is fair-ish, is he said that in spirituality, there's that same inverse law. That's why teachers spend so much time and energy trying to get people off their butts to get started. Because once they get started, then things will start moving more. It's like that landslide or that avalanche that I told you about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you get started, it keeps going, it keeps going, and then you reach a point of non-regression, and it goes faster then, and faster then, and faster then, and pretty soon, boom, you know, you're there in a new world, a much better world. Mm -hmm. A world where things make sense. And now, but, of course, this world looks completely upside down and backwards. I mean, <laughs> if you look at politics in this country, I think it's not hard to see how things are upside down and backwards. Mm -hmm. The kettle calls the pot black, and then puts it on a on a on a uh, a political placard, and says vote for this. Okay, so does that answer that? Sort of. Okay. What more do you want to know? What does he say about karma and kundalini? Well, uh, I don't know, but this is. Like, I guess if the, if the real self is nonlinear. The real self is not linear, nonlinear, exponential, logarithmic, any of that stuff. It's way beyond any of those concepts. Then, then how, how can any work be done to, you know, progress towards it, to, to be, wake up or. Because that nature, the deathless state, nirvana peace the peace that passes understanding uh truth with a capital t absolute truth uh all these words the kingdom of god these are all already within you they're already there all you're trying to do is remove the muck that hides it from you you don't have to look for it you don't have to acquire it it's already there i mean you you have buddha nature of course you do now, but before you can perceive that Buddha nature, you have to get this gunk off. Does that answer your question? Mm. Sort of. I mean, taking the gunk off is done in a linear way then? You could say that. I mean, you could say that. I don't know why you would, but you could. Yeah, first you, you know, you, you start working on, on your stinginess or your greediness. Mm -hmm. You work on a little generosity of spirit. Then you work on the, your discipline. Then you work on your uh, energy. And then you work on your insight. And then you work on your, uh, what about, what am I leaving out? Well, honesty is really important too. You decide to honor your word. And so these things all work together synergistically. So I wouldn't call it linear, no. I'd say that if you do it right, if you use the six paramitas of Buddhism, or you could even use the four, you know, agreements of Ruiz, or you could use the teachings of Jesus or the teachings of Muhammad, the inner teachings of Muhammad, right? Or the Buddha or whatever you want. And these act together synergistically. Mm. And, and you could give it any mathematical function you want as long as it's more powerful than linear. But I'm not a mathematician, so, you know. But I'm but saying it's I'm getting thinking. lost in the weeds, right? 
I, yeah. Let's see, Olympic. Somebody to... wants to train for the for the Olympics. Are they just going to lift weights? Or are they going to lift weights and increase their aerobic activity, and uh, watch their diet, and read about their sport, and study other videos of other great athletes or whatever? They're going to do it all together, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not well, linear in that when, sense. Go ahead. In the sense that I think of it, like you're doing all these things for a result in a point in time in the future. All rivers flow into one. That would be how what I would say is more important than whether it's exponential or uh, multiplicative or linear or whatever. I'd say drive all efforts into one. Mm. Sincerity. And what was the word he used? Uh, he used a word. Was it effort? Was it uh, determination or something? Yeah, he used determination. Mm. But sincerity, determination, uh, purity of intent, dedication of intent, all of these things are the, are the crux of it. Literally the crux. Mm. You're not going to climb a mountain because that's a lot of trouble unless you really want to climb that mountain. Mm -hmm. Which means you'd identify it, you'd figure out what, the, what you'd need to do, what you'd need to bring with you, you know, you'd study who'd done it before and you would go about doing it, but you're not going to do it by accident. You're not going to climb a mountain by accident. Right. Pardon the crude metaphor. All right, sir. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. On the topic of intent, is the is the goal with intent to like have intent in mind always? In mind, heart, body, and soul. Yeah, always. I mean, obviously, you're going to get distracted while you're doing something else. You know, you're doing something at work, right. and you're focused on this or that. But in your in your marrow, in your heart, and is always in the background. You know, I'm trying to get to truth. I'm trying to get to God. I'm trying to get to you know. Uh, something that makes my life worth living. So something I've noticed, I I try to always have it in the background, but then sometimes I try to you know sit down and just like think about the intent or just bring it to mind like really intensely. Good. Yeah. And sometimes that has an effect, and sometimes it doesn't. Correct, but just keep keep at noticeable. it. Noticeable. Keep at it. I remember when I was I, I put up some Tibetan llamas in my house back in the day because they didn't have a place to stay this you know they were just coming over and you know trying to get away from the Chinese but it wasn't uncommon to see these llamas saying mantras all day long to the point where you know you wondered if they said it in their sleep they probably did say it in their sleep because they would they would, mm -hmm. I mean they wouldn't be obnoxious about it they just say it there you could see their lips moving they just do it all day long mm. So, and, and in the Sufi parlance, it's called remembrance. And so, so th these, these tricks of the trade, these, these mechanisms by which people can, can uh, convert their intent into uh, to, to action with results, uh, there's quite a few out there. You can follow the breath. It's always yeah. with you. Do you have any advice for practice while traveling where like my um, habits are disrupted, like my routine is disrupted, if there's any different practices particular to when you're traveling? Yeah, there's a couple that come to mind immediately. One is that you can, okay, you should be conscious of your consciousness. And consciousness always has kind of a flavor to it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. different consciousness on a cold winter morning 
when you first walk out and the grass is crunchy from the frozen mist than at you know eight o'clock at night you have a different consciousness mm -hmm. right i'm not talking about anything particularly mystical i'm just talking about you know that just note your state so as yeah. you travel you keep aware of your state the whole time furthermore as mm -hmm. you travel you get curious about being in a new place with new people and new things and new everything like that so that's interesting too and it's good for the brain because it shakes out some of the cobwebs and then number mm -hmm. three you could do any number of the practices you know the the uh the mantra the following the breath the remembrance the you know the inner intent you know to resuscitate it under when you're traveling is actually probably a bit more powerful because there's less it's less uh routine mm. and then again all journeys are into one right and so mm -hmm. it's it's actually a chance to practice more now if you can i'm not saying you should but if you could i know the dalai lama does this is wherever he travels he sets up a little puja and he does his morning routine anyway mm -hmm. guys up at four in the morning you know talking to the hotel staff <laughs> joking around with them and you know blessing them and stuff like that it's really really impressive but yeah he's doing his okay. his uh, morning routine which i really highly recommend for everybody spend half an hour at least in the mornings just to yourself no screens no email no texts nothing just open a window and look outside or go outside and sit there and, and meditate or something just just take that half an hour for your for your soul before the mm. day comes tumbling all over you so does that help with travel mm -hmm. another thing i've noticed um, particularly with just a lot of non Dharma things, just with work and hobbies. But I don't know if it applies to Dharma work as well. But I, I have a lot of different interests and hobbies and um, Good. ambitions and stuff. Good. Um, but what I found is difficult is being like you know the the idea of like being spread thin. If I'm trying to do too many things at once, I can't focus on a single thing and. Well, you, okay, well then make a practice of focusing on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. That's something you could certainly do. If you're focusing on building model airplanes, focus on that, right? Mm -hmm. Don't do, don't, this multitasking thing is, is hell on, on Dharma practice because your brain is all over the place. You don't even have a brain. You're basically at the mercy of the outside world. It's, it's like, what did uh, Miguel Ruiz called it a mitote. I mean, you, you open up your phone, I mean, you look at your phone and it's like, yeah. and you close it and then it's, it's peaceful again. It's like yeah. somebody should do a, a meme or a, a movie where you, you turn your phone over and then all this black smoke and all this other stuff comes howling out like a, yeah. like werewolves in the night or something. And then you turn it over and they all go away. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I recommend that too. And then before you go to bed. Are we going to have time to do a little Avatamsaka? Yeah, let's do that. All right. I Xerox this book, folks. The old folks will know what Xeroxing means. Uh, this because when I traveled, I wanted to take parts of it with me, and so that was a quite a task. But you know, things like that pay off. All right. Where do you want to go? I'm at page ninety-two. Ninety-two. Mm-hmm. All right. The wonderful adornments of the leaders of the worlds. So a couple of things here. 
the leaders with an S and worlds with an S, just like in the Quran. Leader of the worlds. I love it. 92. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read that paragraph and, uh, and let's see what happens. Furthermore, the Maharaga King Beneficent Wisdom found the door of liberation of using all spiritual powers and techniques to cause sentient beings to amass virtues. The Maharaga King Pure Dignified Sound found the door of liberation causing all sentient beings to get rid of afflictions and attain the joy of coolness. The Maharaga King Adornment of Supreme Wisdom found the door of liberation causing all sentient beings having good or bad thoughts and consciousness to enter into the pure truth. The Maharaga King Lord of Sublime Eyes found the door of liberation comprehending the equality of all virtuous powers without any attachments. The Maharaga King Lamp Banner found the door of liberation edifying all sentient beings and causing them to leave the dark fearsome state. The Maharaga King Supreme Light Banner found the door of liberation knowing the virtues of all the Buddhas and giving rise to joy. The Maharaga King Lion Guts found the door of liberation of the courage and strength to be the savior and guardian of all beings. The Maharaga King, sound adorned by myriad subtleties, found the door of liberation, causing all sentient beings to give rise to boundless joy and pleasure, whenever brought to mind. The Maharaga King, polar mountain guts, found the door of liberation of certain unshakability in the face of all objects, finally reaching the other shore. The Maharaga King, pleasing light, found the door of liberation and showing the path of equality to all, equal, uh, to all unequal beings. At that time, the Maharaga King, dignified light of beneficent, beneficent wisdom, imbued with the power of the Buddha, surveyed the assembly of all the Maharagas and said in verse. Keep going. Observe the purity of the essence of the Buddha, manifesting everywhere a majestic light to benefit all kinds, showing the path of elixir, making them clear and cool, all miseries vanishing, having no basis. All sentient beings dwell in the sea of existence, blinding themselves with evil deeds and delusions. He shows them the way of serenity he practices. Pure dignified sound can well understand this. The Buddha's knowledge is peerless, inconceivable. He knows the minds of all beings in every respect and clarifies for them the pure truth. The adorned top knot can comprehend. Innumerable Buddhas appear in the world, being fields of blessing for all sentient beings. Their ocean of blessings is vast and imme immeasurably deep. Sublime eyes can see all of this. All sentient beings suffer grief and fear. Buddhas, every, Buddhas appear everywhere to rescue them. Extending everywhere through the space of the cosmos, this is the sphere of lamp banner. The virtues in a single pore of the Buddha cannot be assessed by all beings combined. They are boundless, infinite, the same as space. Thus, this vast light banner perceived. The Buddha comprehends all things, is aware of the nature of all things, unshakable as the polar mountain, entering the approach to the truth as lion gut. The Buddha, in vast eons past, amassed an ocean of joy, endlessly deep. Therefore, all who see him are glad. This truth adorned sound has entered. Realizing the real cosmos has no formal characteristics, the ocean of transcendent ways completely fulfilled, this great light saves all sentient beings. Mountain Gut knows this technique. Observe the independent power of the Buddha, appearing equally in the ten directions. Illuminating and awakening all sentient beings, the subtle light can well enter into. I like King Polar Mountain Guts. Polar Mountain Guts. So, uh, do you know what a Maharaj is? I don't. All right, that's why you should turn to page 1632 or somewhere around there to the glossary and look it up. And if that doesn't work, but it should, you should go to the, uh, to the AIs or the internet. great serpent fantastic creature yeah so uh these they use mythical creatures as well and why not uh in in this kind of buddhism and in tantric well i don't know so much in tantric they use these tutelaries and it really doesn't matter that these are images in one way of looking at it it's right there from the past and everything from the past is imaginary right mm. Plus, you can use it as metaphor or whatever, like uh, name. There's some famous general who had some famous nickname. 
old Ironsides. No, that's not right. It's old, you know, something or other. So uh, don't get caught up on that. But there are traditional mythical creatures from ancient India that are used periodically in the Avatam Saka. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it bothered me at first, but then I realized I was being silly. Mm -hmm. Right. All of this is metaphor. The, right. the cosmos has no distinguishing characteristics. It has no properties. Now, I think a couple of days ago, I may say the universe was closed in that it doesn't contain anything outside the universe because if it did, it'd be a different universe. I'm not certain that that statement is correct, that the universe is closed. So that's a place where I, I, I just, I disagree with some current thinkers and I, because I don't know and I'm not sure they do either. Very important in this work not to go beyond what we know. That's very important. And uh, so I'll leave it at that. Anything else before we stop? Caballero? I don't think so. Do you know what a caballero what is? is What's caballero? Cowboy. Horseman, you know. Caballo. Okay. Caballero is a cowboy. All right. Mm. Safe, All right, thank you. Safe travels and... Uh, Keep the faith, baby, and guard your mind and keep the intent going. It's really important. Okay. Take a few books with you. Reflections Which by Idris it? Shah. Reflections by Idris Shah is an easy carry. Okay. But you could take uh, the teachings of Wad Poets, like very it's a hundred and thirty pages. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. All right. Okay. Take good care. Adios. Right.